Scottish agriculture has always looked for ways to innovate to become more efficient and sustainable. Usually these investigations and learnings are limited to dry land, but on this week's Fast TV, we are in beautiful Argyll with the team at Kames Fish Farming, which produces steelhead trout, to hear about the key performance indicators utilised throughout the trout's life cycle. Ben Lee, the hatchery and broodstock manager at Kames, looks after the trout from hatching through to the fish moving to the freshwater lochs. Kames have a broodstock programme to allow them to select their genetics of the trout for performance. Key performance indicators are used by the team at Kames throughout the three-year life cycle to ensure the trout are reaching target weights for harvesting and meet the quality standards. So we care for the fish um, we have them in the tanks here um, with plenty of space. We have them at a very low stocking density. Um, they're fed every day. We remove any mortalities we might get. Um, and yeah, as much as possible, you leave them alone. Fish, uh, they start off as eggs. And when we're talking about eggs, you, you talk about hundreds of thousands or millions. But when we uh, talk about the fish, you're talking about thousands. So in this tank, we have about 15,000 fish. Um, but we will produce we'll talk about sort of tens and hundreds of thousands. So once we've had them here in the hatchery, uh, we'll either move them up to one of our hill loft sites um, to grow on, or they'll go directly to sea. We'll produce two batches. Uh, one batch we'll have for about 10 months, the other we'll have for about 12, 13 months. So in the hatchery, we record uh, things like uh, FCR, food conversion rate, because uh, for us, the growth is very important. Um, feed is obviously very expensive. Uh, we get a good FCR of 0.7 usually in the hatchery. The, the juvenile fish are very good at converting their uh, feed. Um, and so as long as they're, they're growing well, uh, they're in good health, we're happy. So with a feed conversion rate of uh, 0.7, that means you're using 0.7 kilos to grow one kilo of fish, which is great. Juvenile fish have um, FCRs that are common of under one, so 0.7 is good. If uh, fish of this size start to go to 1, 1 1.1, 1 1.2, then you're thinking, hmm, you might be wasting some feed there somewhere. So by having a, a low FCR, you're, you're showing your fish are growing well. So each day we record uh, things like oxygen levels within the tanks. Um, we record pH, CO2 in the tank as well. Um, and that just gives us an indication on the quality of the water in the tank. So the fish require certain levels of oxygen within the water. And if the oxygen drops too low, the fish will start to struggle. They won't be feeding. And if it drops too low, then they will die. So by having them at a certain level, by having alarms in each tank, we, we can be made aware if there's an issue. Just like livestock farming, traceability in fish farming is important to know where each batch of fish have been and to aid the farms in reducing the outbreak of diseases. So we can trace each batch from harvest to input. We have a batch code for each fish, which includes things like the date they were spawned, where they were incubated, where the eggs were incubated, and where they're grown on. So that means we can follow that batch from start to finish, right the way through the process. Well, because you're working with such large numbers of fish, you want to make sure that your stock is healthy. Um, so by recording your performance, your FCR, you can see uh, how well they are growing. You can also then compare batches. Why did this batch not perform quite as well as this, this other batch? Uh, you could look at strains of fish, uh, but with our cane strain, we can monitor uh, and see which batch is performing best. So the benefits of recording the, the data, you can see which batch performs best, as I say. You can also monitor how much you, you have lost, so you can then work on your budgeting for the future seasons. If you lose 5%, you know you can budget on 5 or, or 10, etc. Um, so it's really important for a planning purpose as well. So we, as I said, we record the oxygen, uh, pH, CO2 in each tank. Uh, we do that twice a day. Um, so it's in the morning and in the afternoon. That's all then uploaded online onto a doc, um, an online portal. Uh, so then you can pull reports and, and see your FCRs and, and how they're doing. So just from a few clicks of the button, you, you can see how they're doing. Fish Health Manager, Andre Van, is responsible for optimising the health and welfare of the trout throughout their life cycle, from hatchery to freshwater to seawater at the various sites at Kames. A lot of the work preparing the fish uh, for, for sea transfers happen in freshwater, and then once the fish come out to sea, they come out at the 
what we call it the smolt stage when the fish naturally are ready for, for saltwater transition, um, which is quite common in salmonids. And uh, when the fish are here and at the site in, this, in the sea pens, they are basically fed, cared for, and um, we keep, a, keep an eye on how the growth performance is and we grade them out if, if necessary to make sure we're um, keeping the fish happy and, and, and healthy. Grading uh, is essentially when we split the population down by size essentially. So you have large fish and small fish that are um, spread out into different pens and it's been a really useful tool for fish farming. When we grade the fish, we grade the fish out by size and, and weight, and that's really important for um, breaking the dominance hierarchy that you get in, in fish. You get dominance hierarchies in, in all animals, even in humans, um, but with fish, uh, when you split the fish down from, by weight, uh, you can see improvements in performance and feeding and, uh, and general health. Uh, from, from your whole stock. Yeah, we take sample weights throughout the cycle. Um, generally, we try to aim for roughly once a month, and that gives us uh, an idea of how the fish are performing because we, when we're farming uh, fish, you're not dealing with a few hundreds of animals, you're dealing with hundreds and thousands of animals, um, and you kind of have to look at them as a population rather than uh, one single animal uh, individually. So uh, we, we, we we do sample weights, we do batch weights by, um, uh, on, on each of our pens and sometimes we do uh, profiles so we can look at individual uh, sizes and look at the spread of the population uh, within the pen. And that's, that's when we go back to grading, like if you see um, the population spread, uh, size spread, the weight spread to be too high, then it's really beneficial to split that down so we don't get this kind of dominant hierarchy that you get um, in, in, in normal fish farming. We grade, we grade the fish essentially because um, when a population gets quite large, you, have, um, you start seeing different dominance hierarchies within the fish and they compete against each other for, for feed and space and resources. So it's important for us to grade the fish out and split them down by size and weight. It's, it, it can be quite intense. Um, it's, it's quite a large scale thing that we do. Um, it, we can grade up to 700,000 fish or more within a two-day period. And this is really good for the welfare of the fish because you break that dominance hierarchy and you, you, um, you see massive increases in performance and health, um, welfare and, and uh, feeding rates and growth of the fish when you grade them out by weight. As a fish health manager and fish health specialist within the company, I, um, my role is really to optimize fish health and welfare. So um, that's quite a huge, quite a wide range of things I, I look out for, but um, it can range from diagnosing health conditions, health issues. So they could be um, fish that are sick on site and I'll be out there trying to figure out and doing a bit of detective work, detective work to figure out what's wrong with the fish. Um, I'm advising and speaking to site managers as well to advise them on how to best take care of the stock and what we can do to improve the health of the fish. Uh, and overall, there's a lot of monitoring um, involved as well, so we're keeping an eye on, um, weekly, on a weekly basis, keeping an eye on how the fish are performing at each site, and we can look at uh, feed rates and mortality rates um, to give us an indicator of how the fish are doing and how the site's performing. You can in incorporate um, health checks into uh, the weekly uh, program, so we, we could do uh, lice counts, so we can look at how uh, how the lice is selling, uh, if, if there's any lice on our fish. Uh, when you take the fish out the water as well, you can look at the general gross anatomy, um, gross pathology of the fish. So you're looking at if the fish are in good condition, if they're the right weight, if they're the right um, kind of, if they're too skinny or too fat, that gives us an, a good indicator of what's happening to the fish and if they're doing well. Um, you also just look at, at the pen in general, you look at your stock um, and look at the behavior of the animals and that gives you a really good indicator of what's, what's happening. When you take the fish out um, as well, uh, if you suspect any um, issues like a health problem, then you can do diagnostic tests as well. So you have um, some more broad generic tests such as uh, histopathology when you're looking at specific organs and how the, how the fish are um, how the fish is health-wise from a cellular level. But you also have molecular tests like PCRs. You can do simple swabs or cut out specific um, pieces of tissue and test for specific diseases or um, 
uh, pathogens within that sample. So um, you have a different range of tests, but we also do um, blood testing as well. So um, we can use, we can look at blood biomarkers within the fish. Um, and and one, of the, one example of a biomarker is like glucose in uh, measuring glucose levels in diabetic patients. So the glucose itself is a, is a um, biomarker. So you know, when, when people are, uh, when diabetic patients are, can, can read that glucose level in their blood, and if it's too high, they can take some insulin to um, reduce it and prevent any health problems. You can also um, measure it and see if it's too low, then you can also uh, decide to eat something sugary to raise, raise that glucose level to a normal normal range. So that's kind of what we do as well with, with our fish. We, we take blood samples and look at the biomarkers and see what the ranges are of these biomarkers are and decide whether the fish are healthy and um, it, it informs if, if the fish are healthy or, or, or not. Maintaining high welfare is a priority throughout the fish's production cycle and good husbandry from the hatchery to harvest is important at games. Similar to livestock farming, the aquaculture industry is regulated by a variety of different bodies. Welfare really starts um, from the husband, husbandry side of things. So you're looking at um, making sure your fish are at a good stocking density um, and you're, they're not overcrowded. Um, obviously feeding the fish is, is an essential part of having good welfare. You're really making sure that the fish are living a good life um, and you're keeping, you're keeping them free from any disturbances, any pressures, any stress. Um, making sure they're well fed and they have enough space is, is just the essential parts of, 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 good, of good welfare. Um, from then on as well, just um, doing, any, uh, doing any treatments if, if necessary, if you have any outbreaks of any health issues, um, and also uh, doing any diagnostics if, if necessary to just identify any problems. To ensure our highest welfare, welfare standards are, are met, that we work with um, RSPCA shirt, um, who are essential for keeping, uh, for, we're, we're essential for auditing us as a as a as a farm to make sure that we're, you know, keeping the fish happy, they're fed, and they have lots of space, and they're making sure that we're um, keeping records of all this information that that we're that we're recording. Yeah, as an industry, the aquaculture industry, we're regulated quite heavily. Um, there are bodies that you have to. Um, you have Marine Scotland, you have SEPA, um, and these are government-run uh, organizations. So they they set guidelines of um, where you can farm and how much, how many fish you can have uh, within the site, how much feed you can disperse, and what medicines you're allowed to use. Um, and you also have our um, accreditation bodies, such as Global Gap, um, RSPCA assured as well. And they ensure that we strict, uh, stick to um, strict guidelines of health and welfare to make sure the fish are, um, are, are, are looked after. And also that the people in the company are looked after. Um, and on top of that, you have a few um, other uh, bodies as well, but they're more smaller accreditation bodies. But you're focused mainly on the government side of things, legislation, and then you have the um, accreditation bodies. So as the fish grow larger, um, you naturally see uh, an increase in feed conversion ratios. Um, so as the fish get to the three to four kilogram mark, you see um, FCRs over, uh, over one, whereas in the freshwater stage in the hatcheries, you can see FCRs that are below one uh, quite commonly. So why is fish health so important? Fish health is the most crucial thing to fish farming. It's, it's um, ensuring that the fish are happy and healthy will have a direct impact on their, their performance, their growth, and essentially the husbandry and the care that you put in for the fish is what you get back out of it. And when you, when you have good health and welfare, you get really good, happy and healthy fish. Thank you for watching this crop update for the Farm Advisory Service. I'm Fiona Burnett from SRUC. And as ever, really the issues that we're seeing in crops at the minute are, are driven by weather. So probably of most note in spring barleys, people are really struggling with the amount of secondary green tillers that we're seeing in crops. So they've come about really as a result of that. We had that dry period after we drilled spring barley, fertilizer lying on the surface, and then that rainfall that came at the end of May and into June, where that fertilizer became available and those secondary tillers came through. And that greening 
is really it's about 30 to 70 percent of the crops and it's making decisions about when to desiccate or harvest crops really quite difficult and if those secondary green tillers are making up the majority of the crop then waiting until they are effectively at the right stage to burn off is probably an option but it does mean that the primary crop that initial crop um, is suffering some shedding and, and brackling and conversely if the, the secondary tillers the minority of the crop then just going with the maturity of the primary crop is, is the way to go but really every crop needs to be walked separately at the minute and those decisions made. Um, also in spring barley we're seeing quite a lot of splitting this year so that's where the the grain splits and it affects how evenly it germinates in the malting process and we know that wetting and drying repeatedly um, over the summer is one of the risk factors in, in seeing a lot of splitting so it's not surprising that that's an issue this year. Um, in oilseed rape um, the, the crop for 2024 harvest is going in now um, into quite good conditions so what's gone in is emerging well um, but again as a result of the wet summer we predict that quite a lot of slugs will be about so you know baiting uh, fields and, and treating appropriately uh, is sensible. We're some way off treating for light leaf spot that will come later in the autumn but again a warm and a wet summer period is one of the risk factors in driving light leaf spots so potentially a slightly enhanced risk there. For the rest of the harvest, um, winter wheat harvest ongoing as, as we're filming and you know we've got issues there with, with quality um, and yield but actually probably not as bad as people were fearing so not a record harvest but, but okay um, but variable. And then for potatoes again that you know warm and wet we're now in that kind of key period of blight risk uh, blight is about in commercial crops, but that's not unusual for this point in the season. So we're really into that phase of blight programmes where it's keeping them tight um, and preventing that jump into it being a, a problem for the tubers. So maintaining blight sprays right up until the home is completely gone.